My name is Trey Mangum and this is Shadow and Axe Opening Act. Each week we sit down with some of your favorite Hollywood black creatives to discuss how they made it in the entertainment industry. This week we're speaking to Tyler James Williams, most known for his role in Everybody Hates Chris, among lots of other projects. He currently stars in Hulu's The United States vs. Billie Holiday. I had Tyler reminisce about his first audition, which interestingly enough, has something to do with a medicine commercial. I think the earliest audition I can remember, it, I think it was like a, a children's cold medicine mm. or something like that, like <laughs> Diamond Tap or something like that. And I was like four or five, four or five, something like that. Um, and I remember that was one of the first times I clocked that most casting um, directors are just looking for authenticity. Mm -hmm. That there was like, you know, a bunch of kids who came in who were trying to be like, you know, the cute little um, stereotypical young actor uh, performance. And that's not necessarily what they were looking for. They were just looking for kids who were like there to be authentic. And that's, you know, one of the things I think a lot of, um, a lot of actors, particularly young actors miss. Yeah, yeah. And is a lot of that information for you took from that commercial, did you apply that to Sesame Street also as a young actor? Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's that's the thing. Um, it's it, Everything, I guess, you know, when I really, when I first got started, when you're in that first year or so, you're just soaking up so much information. Not to mention that I'm also like a child, so I'm soaking mm -hmm. up everything. I'm a literal walking sponge. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was the that was the bit of how to be comfortable in front of the camera and be natural. You know, most people don't think about that. When you put a camera in front of any person's face, they automatically go into like a persona or a being that they have, that they think they should be when they're on camera. Um, and a lot of the work is learning to just be natural and authentic in front of it. Um, so that I think was one of the, the first um, inclinations that I got that it was less about performance and being on um, and more about authenticity. And not all child actors are able to transition to adult roles, as we've seen. And since you're one of them who has done that, what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have about being a child actor, especially a black child actor? There's a lot of misconceptions. Um, one of the misconceptions, I think, that really stood out for me the most um, was the idea that what we do can kind of be related to like uh, kids at play and that we don't necessarily take it seriously. Mm. That we're just chasing attention or um, our parents got us into it or whatever. Um, and I think that is the case with a lot, you know, there's a case with a lot of child actors, but there are those who I think, you know, see that you see make the transition that were very much so serious about what they were doing. And I think we don't see children serious about their jobs a lot. And I think that's a, that's a weird color for people to like take in and really think about like, wow, this, this young child is really serious about their life. Um, but that was one of the things is having to convince people that this wasn't just something that I kind of did on the side or I stumbled into or my parents like made me do. This was what I wanted to do. And this was my serious career I was building and that the resume was carefully curated um, and that I seriously cared about what I was taking on. And you talked about your first audition. What was your first on screen credit, whether television or film? And what do you remember about that that you took on with you for the rest of your career? I think my first on screen credit would have to be Sesame Street, I think. I don't know if there was really anything. I don't think if you can you can count commercials and stuff as credits. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, what did I take from that? I think. It, I learned how to be in front of the camera and like what it took to be on screen. I saw the processes, you know, even with that show, there's a lot of rewrites in that show that happened up until the moment of filming. And that's what a lot of people don't think about is like, you know, when you're, you're creating this, this script and this, this project for children to not only get and understand, but to also educate them at the same time. There's a lot of fine tuning and tweaking that happens there. Um, so that was one of like always kind of being on your feet. And then also you got to see these actors and puppeteers 
who would completely fall into the role that they were playing. I think people also think that as well. Like they just kind of stick their hand up the puppet's butt and it's just like, oh, it's but no, they're falling into that. They walk around all day in the voice and being there so it can be authentic in the performance. That's something that they really turn on and off. Um, I think part of that is for the children's benefit who are working on the show, but then also it's just an actor, it's a good actor tip. If you have to fall into a voice of some kind or an accent, it's better to just stay in it um, versus jumping in and out and losing it. Yeah, yeah, that's something I didn't even think about it when it comes to, uh, especially puppeteers, because, yeah. you know, you think that someone's just like, they can be anybody when it's actual an art that goes to that, too, that you don't really think about um, when it comes to especially those children shows. Yeah, there. I mean, a lot of it is, you know, there's a good amount that's kind of improvised as well as they try to find it. And the connection, just improvising in general is difficult. You know what I mean? It's just mm-hmm. something that's just coming. It's kind of like, you know, thinking and talking at the same time and getting like new um, ideas out in like in the world um, but they also have to add in the hand movements as well so not only are you thinking about what you're saying and you're processing it through the filter of the character and then getting it out in the voice and how they would articulate things but it now has to travel through your arm as well it's a lot of work that goes into it that not just anybody can do yeah definitely definitely much respect to all of those who do all those who do that so shifting gears to Everybody Hates Chris, I really think that sitcom is one of the shows that's kind of gotten just better with the time. You know, as you go on, you see a lot of people amending their, I guess, like iconic black sitcom list and adding Everybody Hates Chris, especially in more recent years. So what are your thoughts on that? And did you think that a sh- the show would get to a point where a lot of people are saying, you know, years and years later, oh, this was iconic. We should have given it more flowers when it was at in its early stages um no i mean i I didn't know i was recently i've recently been working my way uh through girlfriends again um (laughs) since it hit netflix and doing you know more research on how that show shaped out because they were shooting next door to us when we shot everybody hates chris um and reggie hayes had a quote that he was like you know one of the least important actors on one of the least recognized shows and at upn at the time that's what we were We were very aware that we were the network that nobody really took seriously, um, that we were considered the um, niche black network. Um, So we knew we were making stuff that we liked and we knew that we made stuff that we thought was like, you know, really good, but we never knew if anybody would ever appreciate it. Um, I didn't really get an inclination that that might be the case until actually the show was canceled. And then in syndication, it rose. And there was like, you know, our fan base grew significantly after we wrapped in 2009. Um, I was really surprised by that, that people of all races, colors and creeds found a way to relate to this show. Um, so now to hear it coming back up in conversations is that it's, it's always shocking because when we shot it, we didn't really feel that love as much. You know, our first season was very important we got nominated for the golden globe and all of that but then once that merger with the cw happened our numbers started tanking like all the other black shows that were on upn so we were very much so told that nobody was watching it yeah and actually uh last year when you tweeted all the fun facts for the anniversary and we're like on a network that doesn't exist anymore it reminded me because you know essence atkins and rachel true and from half and half and then other sitcom stars have often talked about you know um essence even called it like the gentrification of up when it turned to the cw so in general how do you think black entertainment would where it would be today if we still had this network where all of our stories could be on and then especially in the streaming era now where you know like you said everyone it was watching everybody hates chris when it was in syndication but not necessarily at that time so how do you think things would play out differently had all of the shows that were on upn gotten the attention they deserved and you know we continued throughout the years as well because you know there was kind of this absence after when that first happened there was this absence until probably probably around the advent of blackish until you saw like black sitcoms so what do you, where do you think we would be at if that didn't happen? Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. It created a void. There was a vacuum of a lot of black content that then later ended up to me popping up in this black renaissance 
um, that felt like it started around like 2012, 2013 of a lot of like independent and streaming shows by a lot of black curators that were like, you know, getting us back to that place. But I think that what was the, the, the big tragedy is that we didn't hit network TV again like that. You know, everybody knows that network TV hits the masses. And what also is very concerning about that is the fact that network TV, while we're doing is selling advertising time for major brands. So it means that those brands don't necessarily see people who watch black centered shows as their target audience to sell, let's say, paper towel or, you know, dish detergent. And that's the to me, that's what is really unfortunate there, that not only are our stories not being told um, on the network TV landscape the way they used to be, but now these brands are being told, whether it's directly or indirectly, that because these shows can't survive on a network like, you know, UPN and UPN can't exist, that their brands don't have to cater to the market that comes along with those shows. Um, I think it did a, not only us a disservice, but I think it did that network a disservice. Um, and I, I loved, I saw what es uh, Essence said, because uh, she was right, you know what I mean? We kind of kept that network alive. And then for Everybody Hates Chris specifically, we helped build the CW. When they were pulling all the shows that they think could help launch this brand new network and nobody knew what shows were on anything. And, you know, you look at the Girlfriends movement as well. They were like moving them around from night to night. They were moving Everybody Hates Chris around from night to night, just seeing what would happen. We were used as a foundation to build a network that, you know, ended up going in a completely different direction. Um, and I think that's the case that we see in you know Black America all the time. We see that, you know, black people coming forward and black artists and even in this election, black women in particular, stepping up to push us in a direction. And then a lot of times we forget about that. And even when you think about it, it had been years before there was a black led show on the CW after that. And then now it's like since, you know, I don't want to say diversity is in, but since diversity is kind of in now, it's like a night with like, you know, black lightning, all American. All American has an HBCU spinoff that's in development. Um, Ava DuVernay has a show coming on soon. Like it's kind of like they're uh, investing into those stories that they hadn't invested in a long time. And, you know, all progress, you know, it, it moves the needle at some point. But it's just it's just hard to think about, you know, these shows that could have gone on for several more seasons had this not happened. What's crazy to me is that it feels like we're repeating a cycle where we saw all of these, you know, really big black and specifically comedies, but then also shows in the 90s. When you think about on network television, how much black centered content was on network TV. And then all of a sudden we kind of got into the early 2000s and we acted like we didn't know that that could be possible and things started falling away. And now we're back like, oh yeah, this works. We always knew it works. We know it works. <laughs> we know that's the case. If you put the money behind it, the people will come to it. So although it is in currently, it's just a matter of realizing that it's always been in. It's just trending currently, but it's not like anything new happened. And as an actor developing to this new and developing and adapting to this new landscape, you know, does this make you want to shift more toward streaming content? Because, you know, a lot of black creators, you know, Shonda Rhimes went to Netflix. Um, Spike Lee has a Netflix deal. Um, Regina King is at Amazon. I think Viola Davis is at Amazon as well, especially considering, you know, how I guess fickle broadcast has become with, you know, you see so many shows coming on and there'll be one season, 20 episodes and done when that same show may have gotten a little bit more of a life on a streaming giant. So do you think that plays any part in you deciding, OK, I want to do this role or do I want to like, you know, wait for streaming because you can go to streaming and you may be on one season and it's critically acclaimed and people love it. Or you may be on network TV and you may run for several seasons, but people may not see it, especially if that show doesn't have a deal in place. I think there's a balance. Um, but for me, ultimately, um, I go where my people are. I go where the people that I want to work with. And, you know, I, I've been able to pride myself and had the privilege of working with friends a lot. Um, and if they're at streamers, then I guess that's where I'm going to be. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's kind of, that's how that goes. Um, I think network is in a very interesting place right now. 
where it has to adapt to the current landscape um because yeah so many content creators want this like kind of it's it's attractive to be able to make a show and know that all of the episodes will come out at one time or at least on a platform where they can sit and people will be able to appreciate that even if they trickle to it slowly versus the week-to-week grind of network networks very hard to keep those numbers up um so i think we're, we're in this shift that happens in the industry like it feels like every five years where the game just changes completely and everything that was the case before is no longer um but you're gonna see a lot of particularly black content creators um i think move to streamers just so things can have a chance to sit there yes it can be you know on network tv and we all know how network tv money works and the episode counts are higher and all of that but i think people ultimately as artists want to have their stories told in completion and it feels like that's a that's the better bet right now because of syndication i feel like most people clearly will identify you most with your role on everybody hates chris is that something over the years you know that you accept that you're more identified with that role or are you in the position where i've done all this other stuff too that you need to watch or is it something that you how does that how do you process that um, I th- definitely think it's been a process um, for me. I think where I am currently um, on it is I appreciate whatever people appreciate. Um, I'm in a phase in my career where I'm doing things for me now, um, which is which is really beautiful and very fulfilling. Um, we we all have those like kind of things that end up becoming very popular. Um, but those passion projects to us mean something very specific and very, um, very intimate. However, that's the nature of the game. Um, at this point, I'm proud to have been in people's minds and TV screens for over a decade at this point. Um, and I can appreciate what they appreciate. Um, and ultimately, I think that's the point. You know what I mean? We do what we do for us, uh, hopefully for us and for the art of it and what we feel creatively drawn to. What people respond to is really up to them. And I'll appreciate that. If I judge, you know, how, what's successful by what people respond to, then I'll always kind of be all over the place and kind of fishtailing, chasing the hit. Um, I just want to make good work. And if people like that, great. If they don't, that's also good too. Whatever it is that you 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 saw of mine that resonated with you, I'm good with that, as long as it was something. Our Black Entertainment Fact of the Week. Which Black actress was not nominated at the 2016 Academy Awards? Was it Ruth Nega, Viola Davis, Octavia Spencer, or Taraji P. Henson? You can vote in our poll on shadownack.com and we'll tell you the answer next week. What's the biggest lesson that you think you learned from being on the show that you can still apply to your career today? That's, that's, there's so many lessons. You know I me, mean? I, I learned how to, you know, I think I would, because I was the lead and I've been having this conversation with uh, several people um, recently where our, people will ask me, you know, when are you gonna lead a show again? And they ask that, and my response usually shocks them. And I'm like, I'm not really, that's not what I'm looking to do actually right now. And they're really shocked by that. Like, how can that not be the pinnacle of all the things? Um, And I have to explain, like I did that when I was 12. Um, So I'm not chasing that. I think a lot of actors in their career where they are, you know, at the age that I am are still chasing that. And I think one of the biggest things I took from that is you really have to appreciate and support your lead. That's why right now I think I feel very comfortable and very fulfilled. Like today, you know, Andrew Day gets nominated for a Golden Globe to support the lead in that. It's weird. I feel more accomplished in that than I ever did leading a show. Mm. It's really because I know what it takes to lead a show and I know how hard that is. And I think that's the thing that I learned the most. I became a much better supporting actor by being a lead and knowing what that takes and how hard that is. Um, Yeah, I think that would be the biggest takeaway. 
and I think that's something I'm coming to in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the underrated iconic Disney Channel original movie Let It Shine it deserves so much shine no pun intended than it gets what was the feeling of being on a black Disney Channel film because there's not many they're few and far between because when you think about diverse ones you you got Cheetah Girls you got maybe Twitches but as far as black Disney films like this one and jump in with Corbin Blue and Kiki Palmer those are the only two that you really uh, think about so at the time when you were filming this and you know the movie came out going on press did it sink into you that this was such a monumental film and I I I presume that you know if it's not the most recent black led Disney Channel original movie then there's still few and far between yeah, I mean, no, I, I very much so knew, and it was very stressful for me actually in um, in promoting that film because not only was it a primarily black led film for Disney, we were introducing battle rap to the Disney Channel community, <laughs> <laughs> and that was a, that's a task. You know, that's not an easy thing to do, particularly something that it feels like is you know on the short list of specifically black Olympic sports. Um, you know, if there was a Black Olympics battle, rap would be in there. Um, and that's, you know, I understood what came with that. I understood how hard that was going to be. And I understood that if we failed to make it a success and to get it to resonate with people, that there may not be that many others that came behind it. Um, so I was very much so aware of how difficult that was going to be and what we were going to be doing there. Um, and I tried to have that conversation, you know, with the cast. I remember talking about that with a very, very, very young Trevor Jackson at the time. Um, be like, yo, we have to, we have to put the work in here. This isn't just, we can't handle this. And I think, you know, black people will be able to speak to that in any situation. We have to work twice as hard. We just have to, because if this doesn't do well, it will reflect on everyone who comes behind us. And Coco was actually, I think she did a YouTube video a few months ago talking about her experience on the movie and also said how, you know, there were, you know, rumors and murmurs about there being a sequel. It just never surfaced or anything. Did you know anything about it potentially coming back? And would you, you know, be open to revisiting it at some point? I guess it would be on like Disney Plus and not Disney Channel this time. But um, what are your feelings about that? Yeah, I saw that video and I was really confused um, actually by it because to my knowledge, there was only one phone call um, that was, you know, that we had about a sequel, and I had it with uh, Gary Marsh, who was the president, um, I think, of television at the time at Disney, um, and he had called to talk about it, and we definitely had a conversation, but I was already locked into another project called Dear White People at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about that and the subject matter of that. And you know, at the, when we shot Let It Shine, I was 19, um, about to turn 20. So I was a bit older and the subject matter of the stuff I wanted to do was getting older. Um, and one, I had a conflict. And then two, we realized I may not be within the range of Disney scope anymore. Um, and that's where that died, I believe. As far as revisiting it, yeah, I'm you know, I'm open to it. I'm open to it. Uh, if we can find the story, um, you know, everything for me is story first. Story, story, story. Um, not just nostalgia. <laughs> if there's a story here, um, I'm not a, I'm not opposed to it um, because I think it it did do something for the culture, particularly you know, black kids to be able to see not only other black kids as the stars of this movie, but then also to be speaking the language that is hip hop to not, you know, necessarily whitewash um, a lot of the music, but to go into it and go like, no, we're going to try to give you some bars here, actually. It's going to be hard because it's Disney. We can only save up so much, but <laughs> we're going to try to give you some bars. And I'm glad you brought up Dear White People because, you know, it's, you know, the, the TV spinoff is still running. Um, its final season is coming up. And of course, that wasn't your first film role, but it was such a different film role for you so and it was kind of like that that transition role kind of like kind of how Zendaya is you know went through hers with Euphoria and like with Malcolm and Marie coming up but how did that feel knowing that you would be seen in a different light than you had been seeing your whole career um I think that was the point of that movie for me you know what I mean we were looking for something that could turn the narrative on its head and that was a risk like very specifically was a risk um, and, you know, at the time, there wasn't as much 
the black content as there is now that were so vocal and we were doing a movie called dear white people <laughs> we didn't know if that would even get out let alone if anybody would see it um uh it was it was by design design a risky move i i had those kind of moments in my career where like you know particularly when you're known and something's really popular i think everybody has to do that if you have something that comes out and you're really popular and you're seen as one thing the next move is to make the riskiest move that you can go in the complete opposite direction and turn it on its head um and that was that was my plan for that film and you know i'm happy that it, it worked out and then went on to be a much bigger success outside of you know all of us that original cast um everybody's here doing great work tessa's doing all of the things uh, tiana um also doing all of the things with like also with wandavision now and brandon is still out there with the actual show um so i think that speaks to justin simeon's ability to spot talent um and a bunch of people who were ready for a paradigm shift in their careers yeah it's it's interesting because i do feel like Dear White People, the movie was a little bit ahead of its time. Like a lot of the stuff, a lot of the stuff that was said in that movie in 2014, um, kind of really didn't become you know commonplace until about you know 2016 ish. So then by the time the show came out, it was like okay, everything makes sense because this is this isn't anything that's radical now. This is kind of like <laughs> it was a radical message then. You know, even some people were like wait, what is this? But now that this pretty much the same content is in the show, it's like it's you know people are like seeing it. So I, Justin was definitely ahead of his time. Oh, he one. was definitely ahead of his time. I remember reading that script and I read it, you know, cover to cover in one sitting. It was like, this is possibly one of the most important things that I have ever done. Um, and I have to do this film and I have no idea if it's going to be well received because everything was super risky at the time. I remember that press tour um, for Sundance and being like, yeah, we're going to go out here. We're going to promote a movie that's called Dear White People and people are going to automatically off top say it's divisive and it's not what america needs right now and all that but we kind of needed to stand there and say it and i think that's what's going to make justin a a voice for some time he's willing to do that him and a you know executive producer of lena waith an unknown lena waith at the time they were ready to say stuff that nobody wanted to hear and that's what made them and has made them culture shifters i think for us yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And talking about The Walking Dead, I still think that your character's death is by far one of the most gruesome things <laughs> that ever happened in the series. And I know back then, I think it's probably not that bad now, but when it was in its peak, when, you know, people tuning in every week, I know that you all had to be very, very um, secretive. You couldn't say, like, what you were doing, how this was going to happen or anything. And going into that show, have you ever had a show like that where you were kind of like out of the loop that much? And basically, how was that experience like uh, knowing that, you know, your character's going to have an inevitable death, but you don't really, <laughs> you still don't see what's coming? You just have no idea what's coming. Um, yeah, no, I'd never worked on anything like that. They hid me for months. Like they literally hid me in Georgia for months. I was in, so not even Atlanta at first, because they thought Atlanta, I would be seen around too much. I was in like Sonoy, Georgia, which is backwoods, um, Georgia, until the announcement came out. Then they, they moved me to Atlanta. Um, so that was just a process to know, like people were trying to figure out why I was there um, and what this character could mean and all that. So it was like, it was this interesting, like kind of phenom that was also a clue game as well as a show um behind the scenes um and you know it is really interesting being on the show where you know that at some point they're gonna kill every one of us and you just don't know what's up it's a russian roulette every time you read the script every time a script would drop everyone would just get quiet and read it and like is this the one is this the one where i go um but it actually made me fall in love with character deaths strangely enough it's something that i kind of became obsessed with for a while and then ended up doing it again in Detroit, you know, right after it, of to be able to take a character and fill them with life and then walk it all the way through to their literal final moments is very cathartic because a lot of times for us, we fall in love with these human beings and they're, we're their greatest advocates and we embody them. And then the story ends and we just kind of have an imagination of what they went on to do. <laughs> and they're like, I think they did this. And maybe they made this decision. But to actually close the story 
is a really powerful feeling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's it's kind of like when shows, you know, are going to end and but you know they're going to end. You know that your characters can have some sort of resolution. So, it's even even with the show still going on now, it's been on for so long, like you're going to know when it's going to end. So, at least you don't have to like worry about like, you know, something happening and there being this open-ended conclusion. So, that's a good thing about, you know, a lot of shows are like that now. And I think that, you know, people are more cognizant because you know, most shows are streaming. They're able to, you know, at least plot out like, you know, final season, we're going to have this person do that. And then, you know, you won't get like angry tweets and things from <laughs> yeah. fans who are I mean, upset that's, about the show. It happened with us with, you know, with Chris, we had an idea that maybe we may be ending. We weren't sure. Um, and then it just happened. And the biggest question I get about that show always is what happened <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> what 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 was the ged thing um and that's you know like you, we were talking about that earlier about you know people having the streamers and all that and knowing that they can do that there's something about being able to wrap up a story and give closure to a story particularly when it's something that was really important to you human connection knows no bounds when you connect to a character whether or not that person is actually real doesn't matter. You're connected. You want to have some kind of closure. Um, so I'm, I'm happy that I was able to give that to that. But then also we're getting into a space where we can give people more closure on shows. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I want to talk about your current film, The United States versus Billie Holiday. Uh, and your day is just incredible. Trevante is incredible. You're incredible in the movie. Um, it's really, really something. And I want to know, how is this role any different than your prior roles like it's you know it's a historical um i know lee hasn't called it a biopic but i guess a historical drama about this icon and information that people may not have been um known about her before and the court case just everything that was going on and why she is so legendary right now so how is this different than your previous roles I think it's it's different in two ways. One, for me, like we were speaking to earlier, there are things that you know I do that really resonate with people or shows I've done in the past that people just love. Um, but then there are those roles where it feels like I'm actually doing something and I'm furthering a conversation. Dear White People is one of those roles. Um, this is also another one of those. Um, I love speaking to the unsung characters and people in our history who never really got their due. We're telling this story finally um, accurately for the first time. And I think that's what really attracted me to this was not only telling Billy's story in a way that had never been told um, because we know that although Lady Sings the Blues was the phenom great that it was, that it may not have been the most accurate portrayal of Billy. Um, by those who were like you know involved in producing it and had invested interest in making it look a certain way um so that was important and then you know with taking on the the story of lester young specifically um that's a name that i think most people in the black community don't understand and they don't really know um if you're a jazz you know fan you probably know his name but you may not know that he you know redefined the saxophone he changed the way people played it um, so that's the other piece of it for me. One is the like the culture pushing conversations, keeping our voices out there and our stories told. But then the other one is giving voices to those who didn't have a voice in history or no longer have a voice in history. People should know their names. There weren't just these huge events. I want to know the story of um, everybody in the crowd at Selma. You know what I mean? Like that's, mm. they each have an individual story. We talk about those who were you know, out in the front, but each one of those people were heroes who furthered the movement. So I love any character that is a hero that furthered the movement that we don't know about. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Opening Act featuring Tyler James Williams. You can watch the full interview and catch exclusive content on lunchtable.com. Create an account and watch other Shadow Night content such as Reel It Back and Shadow Act Live. Until next time.